So today our speaker is Chris Spearman, former uh, mayor of Lethbridge, and he will present on what we learned about city, uh, what he learned about city finances as mayor. So please welcome former mayor Chris Spearman. Thank you. Okay. Well, it's February the 2nd, and look who's popped up out of the ground. <laughs> so uh, I wanted to talk today a little bit. You know, uh, I think the city of Lethbridge is going through some challenging times. And uh, I want to share what I learned about city finances, because, uh, you know, some of the things I learned, or, or think I learned, or some may be right, some may be wrong, but I'll share what I think I learned. Some basic principles, uh, I want to talk about my, my background. So before I became the mayor, I was responsible for the finances at the Black Velvet Distilling Company, uh, uh, an industry in the industrial park. And that gave me some uh, background, and I had some background in finances, and I had some uh, experience as uh, managing expenses, including municipal taxes. Of course, I was a resident of Lethbridge for more than 40 years. and. Uh, then uh, I came to the city of Lethbridge and uh, I looked at things like uh, financial reports to city council and I found some interesting differences between the private sector and the public sector and it took me a little while to understand what those differences were and uh, I found that the emphasis at the, at the city of Lethbridge was more on maintaining quali quality services uh, and it seemed to be less on managing uh, the actual tax rate. That was my perception as I came in. And then uh, I found, when we'll see them in a second, um, w one of the significant things was that I observed in the financial statements was that where I was, we would budget, but we'd almost never, uh, our actuals almost never matched the budget. And I, when I looked at the city financial reports at the end of the year, there were large departments where the budgets actually, the actual, matched the uh, budget to the exact dollar. And I thought, wow, that's fascinating. And so, so today my talk, I don't mean to be political. I'm not going to be critical of uh, current mayor and council. Uh, I do have political views, and uh, uh, I'm sure they color my views in other areas, but more uh, my concerns these days are more provincial and, and federal. Uh, and, uh, but I do certainly have an attachment to uh, the city of Lethbridge, I should tell you. Uh, I no longer am a resident of the city of Lethbridge. I sold my house, and I have moved to uh, a rural area out, out of town. And uh, so I guess I don't have a dog in this fight anymore, but I thought it might be helpful to share what I did learn. Mm -hmm. And I want to provide possible solutions to consider. So there is a principle uh, in the city of Lethbridge, and I think it's an honorable one. The, the chain of office for the mayor has the names of all the previous mayors on it. And the principle is that you build on what the previous councils have done. So. Uh, so today, I'm going to try to honor that principle. I'm not going to be critical of past mayors or councils. I'm just simply going to prepare the facts. And again, as I said, not a criticism of current mayor and council. One of the challenges we have as municipalities right now is the provincial government downloading to municipalities, reducing municipal flexibility. And uh, that may be my bias, but I have some specific examples. So the grants in lieu are reduced. So grants in lieu are what uh, other governments pay to the municipal government for uh, the equivalent of property taxes. So they have sidewalks going by their buildings. If they have a fire, they expect the fire department to show up. Uh, if, if, you know, again, they would have, uh, they'd benefit from police services and all other uh, municipal services that are provided. But the, uh, the provincial government has consistently reduced over time uh, their grants in lieu on properties that they own. That's been one challenge. 
Um, the province retains higher percentage of traffic revenues. So this government increased their percentage of traffic revenues from roughly about 28% to 37%, but it's, a, it's an erosion. Probably the biggest challenge going forward is uh, there is no plan to replace something called the MSI, or the Municipal Sustainability Initiative. And the City of Lethbridge and other municipalities have benefited from that for many years, and it funds many of the capital grants. It helps to pay for capital grants. And the principle was, when it was introduced by the Progressive Conservative governments back about 2008, was that local decision making would be better in terms of choosing which capital priorities were important. But this program uh, was scheduled to be phased out with no replacement uh, in 2024. So that'll be a challenge going forward, having capital funding, and there was a little bit of operational funding as well. Uh, but when that, when that phases out, uh, that will be uh, a challenge for municipalities to uh, continue with uh, ongoing capital projects. So we were very successful, I think, in terms of developing new assets in the city of, uh, during my term and our council's term. There were a number of things that were built because we could access uh, capital funding grants, uh, and one of them was MSI where we, we had the flexibility to choose which were our priorities. This is going to be really hard to, uh, to read, but just to illustrate that, and do I have this right? The very first one is <laughs> municipal sustainability, sustainability initiative. The, uh, the amount that we got in 2021 was $22 million. This isn't small change. Not, not small change, and each year uh, there were significant contributions from MSI in the range of 15 to 20, 22 million uh, to MSI. When municipalities don't have that money, that's going to put a lot of more pressure back on local taxpayers. <coughs> and I apologize for the size of that screen, but the uh, this will be this will be available. The slideshow will be available to anybody afterwards. So, okay. There's also been uh, a suggestion by some that the previous council lacked foresight by implementing 0% tax increases for 2020, 2021, and 2022. Now I would, my, my response to that is I don't think there was a council that spent more time assessing the, our finances. And uh, so uh, we did have a presentation from an organization called BUILD, which is the uh, investment community, and the Chamber of Commerce in the fall of 2018, mm -hmm. and telling us that Lethbridge taxes were too high for, from an, an investor's point of view. And uh, we also had some existing non-residential taxpayers, basically businesses, looking to expand outside of the city. And so uh, that, was, that was a heads up to begin with. And here's what the tax increases have been over time. Just to give you some, so, uh, you know, uh, inflation didn't, you know, tax increases going back to about 20 years. And here's inflation for the last same period, 20 years. So you can see the last two years, the uh, rate of inflation has been fairly high. And here's the mix. So here's tax increases in red and inflation in blue. So just, just to give some perspective of uh, what tax increases have been in the city of Lethbridge versus cost of living over the same period of time. So many of the changes that go on depend a lot on, the, on the, the city managers, and I think we were lucky to have some very good city managers. When I first was elected, Garth Sherwin was the city manager. He had been a former treasurer, had a really solid understanding of uh, city finances, but he also was a visionary. Um, he, he wanted to make sure that the city infrastructure was maintained well. We invested a lot in maintaining the city infrastructure, but he could think forward and look at great business opportunities. So I had some, a lot of respect for Mr. Sherwin. Um, one of the things that he came up with, uh, he saw that horizontal infrastructure 
prices, the bids on horizontal infrastructure, which is basically roadways and uh, in, in associated road, were, were coming in uh, significantly under budget, about 20 to 30 percent. And we had Whoop Up Drive and Métis Trail scheduled to be completed in 2022. And he said, it makes financial sense to bring that forward four years and have them finished by 2018, given the pressures of growth on the west side. And so we did that. And I think that those are the types of things. If we had not finished Whoop Up Drive extension from beyond the fire hall uh, to where the leisure center is now, uh, that would have created uh, a huge traffic issue. And I think uh, finishing Métis Trail and making a parallel trail to University Drive four years ahead of time also made a lot of sense. So I compliment uh, Mr. Sherwin for his uh, his foresight as well as his uh, fiscal management. So um, we actually had five city managers in the time that I was the mayor and actually five really in the last term because he, re he resigned just after the 2017 municipal election. So then uh, we had an interim city manager, uh, Mrs. Kathy Hopkins, who had the confidence of the of the, of the uh, staff at the city. Uh, she'd been also um, over 30 year employee. Then we hired Mr. Bramwell Ch Strain, who was, uh, I think, an innovator. He had had uh, experience at the federal level and at a provincial level as a deputy minister. And uh, he really understood how governments worked, but he'd never worked at the municipal level before. And he came and he did things very differently. And so when he listened to the presentation, uh, along with council, um, and said, we can do something about that. And uh, he came up, he said, we're, we're, going to, we're going to have outsiders compare each and every department at the city of Lethbridge. And uh, they, the, me the methodology is to compare against other cities. So it's really difficult to get comparable information about city to city. And every city is different. So uh, we'll see what happens from that. But that was, I think, his significant contribution in the short time that he stayed. I think he, we employed him for about 17 months. He left for personal reasons, but he made a big difference in the city uh, as well. So he, he was impactful. And then uh, when he left, we had Jody Melly, another uh, long-serving city employee, as our acting city manager, and then subsequently hired Mr. Dalton, who uh, he stayed until just after the, uh, the last municipal election. And then I think early, about a year ago, I think he gave his notice. And uh, so now we have uh, another uh, city manager, Mr. Lloyd Brierley, who actually came to Lethbridge probably three or four years ago. And he had been the infrastructure manager and now is the city manager. So there's been a lot of change in city managers, but city managers also make a, uh, a great difference. There has to be a good relationship between the mayor and the city manager and with council and the city manager as well for, for great things to happen. <coughs> Okay, so Mr. Strain's idea was to hire KPMG. And uh, KPMG did these external reviews of each and every department. And I think those reviews still have value today. You can go back to those reviews because uh, they came up with some very interesting comments. So uh, they're all available. These KPMG reviews are available on the city website and they're worth reading. They're a little detailed for many people, but I think they're a great resource still and you can still go back there. But the principle of verifying information and externally, I think is a good one. And I, I, I said to Mr. Strain, like these are expensive reports. How are we gonna pay for them? He said, don't worry about it, we have the money. Hmm. So uh, these independent external comparisons against other municipalities do provide, on a department by department basis, really good information. They provided reports and recommendations, and it's, as I said, results are available on the, on the city's website. And you can still go back to those and the city could still benefit from them. So every municipality is different. Uh, you can't really, uh, people talk about apples and oranges, it's a fairly, uh, it's, it's kind of a slogan. Um, but some are, more, some are less different than others. So you, you can compare against, you can compare, 
some different aspects of municipalities. We, we tried before KPMG to get other municipalities to uh, work with us to do comparisons, and for various reasons, many of them are reluctant. So it's good to have somebody independent like KPMG actually do the work for you. And you can only do this every so often. I don't know if uh, when the last time the city of Lethbridge actually had an external organization do a, a review like KPMG did. So uh, it hadn't, hadn't been done for at least 20 years. So what's unique uh, about other cities we might compare to? So uh, Medicine Hat, for example, has their own utilities and has a revenue stream from utilities we don't have. You know, so uh, not, not, a, not a great comparison in terms of the overall uh, budgets because they have revenue streams we don't have. But you could, you could compare uh, departments and functions. Uh, when you look at all the cities, uh, probably the closest comparison is Red Deer. I think uh, one of the exceptions, because population-wise they're very similar, uh, the obvious difference is they, we have a, our own municipal police force and they have the RCMP. And interestingly, back in, uh, you know, if you have an RCMP fo uh, police force, the federal government uh, actually contributes to the cost of your policing. Um, I think it's about 10% or something like that, which, which, which is significant. Yep. We could never qualify for that. It's never really an option for Lethbridge to go back to the RCMP uh, or it would be more expensive because uh, back in the early 90s, the government said, no more. We're no longer going to be contributing to larger sized cities uh, if they switch to the RCMP. So the 10% uh, subsidy is no longer available. So uh, anyway, one of the things that is different is policing costs. But otherwise, you could probably compare Lethbridge and uh, Red Deer fairly closely. Okay, there were some statements made during the presentations which differ from the KPMG findings. So, uh, uh, you know, the, in terms of uh, that we might be under, understaffed in terms of policing, KPM didn't find that. So when you go to the uh, KPMG uh, phase three, and that was 2018, 2019, uh, they looked at a range of cities and said Lethbridge is comparable in terms of what they call a, a cop per pop ratio. Uh, so that was a, that's, a, that's just one ratio, but uh, their finding was different. So uh, I have, uh, I guess my thing is, uh, I don't know who's right, but I'd say trust but verify. But I always, always use an independent source. So uh, they, we certainly had challenges in terms of when I was the mayor and our council. Um, we wanted to figure out how we could uh, have effective policing and how we could be innovative. And I give a credit to uh, Chief Rob Davies back at the time for, uh, we said, how can we do it cheaper and, and, and actually have more bodies? And he came up with the idea of the community policing model, uh, basically the, and the uh, community uh, uh, peace officers and also the, uh, the watch. And he said, these, these are things that we could do to get more, more feet on the ground and try to do that cost effectively. So he looked at that. So uh, people say, well, what happened to the police budget? Don't we fund them? And uh, yes, we do. And when, when I looked at the numbers, we actually increased the police budget 20% over seven years. So we'll see that in a second. The, the unaudited financial report uh, provides a lot of very good information. You can verify all of this. And again, as, as I said, the KPMG reports, uh, all these things are on the city website. So you can go back and verify them. So again, very small numbers here. See it on your screen? Yeah. Okay. So this, I just needed to re read what it was, but uh, I'm going to flip through these. These are the, uh, this is a, the department summary. So these are the departments that are funded by taxation from the unaudited uh, reports at City Hall. So basically, this is the police budget on the second line, for example, but every other, sir, all the other budgets are here. And so, as I mentioned earlier, you'd have a, a, a budget, 
and then the actual, and then here's the variance. And there's a $30 million budget in 2014, $30 million actual, and the variance is zero. And I'm not picking on the police, that happened in other departments as well. You can see zero variances. And there's a reason for that. I'm gonna explain it, and, it, and it, makes, it makes some sense. So, as you, as you go through the different pages, and I'll get to the very last one. Okay, here the police budget up is gone from th from uh, 30, 30 million to thirty seven million by twenty twenty one. So that's the uh, that's that's the twenty seven the twenty percent increase. So policing did get regular increases. So it wasn't that they were frozen. I think uh, the last budget the, the what happened at the very end was. Uh, over the approved budget that, that had been given at the last minute, a motion came to cut a million dollars from the police budget. So it, they had had regular increases, but that got a lot of public attention, that, that $1 million reduction. But all along, it had been going up. So they're still, they were still about 37, 30, 37 million. So I mentioned the... Uh, this is something that I learned about. The, uh, what's called the budget appropriation unexpended. So what they call BAUs. And when I asked about the KPMG reports, um, Mr. Strain, the city manager said, there's, there's lots of money in the BAUs to pay for key pay KPMG. So what happens is the departments are allowed to carry money over in the four-year budget system. So they didn't all have to spend it in one year. The rationale was don't force departments to spend money just to use up their budgets. Allow them to carry it over so they make more effective budget, budgeting decision making. So, so, but there had been money building up in reserves and BAUs, and people who look at municipal budgets say, well, if the reserves are growing, are people being overtaxed? So uh, how much flexibility does it give people? And I think the, the BAUs, as, it, as, it come, uh, as we came to the end of this budget cycle, I think were being used, uh, they were being drawn down, reduced because of the zero tax increases, departments were using up their BAUs. <laughs> So one of the risks we have going forward, if you have high annual operating expenses, they reduce future financial flexibility. Having, going through an exercise like KPMG did and recommending reductions, and uh, those are really difficult decisions and very, you know, they're not pleasant to implement. To, to reduce downwards, and it, it can have effects on morale. It can, uh, you know, these are, these are challenging. So you have to be careful as you allow budgets to increase and say, is that all really truly justified? If you use your money for annual operating expenses also, that reduces your money available for matching grants. So if, you're, uh, if you are thinking about future capital projects and we th think also about the loss of the MSI funding, the capital funding that's potentially going to happen from the federal government, but having less money available for capital could be a potential problem in the future. Also, uh, if budgets are increasing, uh, possibly that results in staff creep, and of course human resources expenses are uh, some of the most six significant expenses at the city. And uh, as I said, difficult, they're difficult to roll back in the future. So I talked about the BAUs. Uh, these were budget rollovers, basically a form of reserve uh, to allow m greater financial flexibility over a longer period of time. And uh, I would say that uh, budget, unexpected, uh, un unexpended budget funds probably need more transparency. There, there is a whole report. Okay, 
I've got five minutes left. There's a whole report in, in the uh, unaudited financial reports deck on BAUs, and you can see that over time. You could track them and see what's in the BAUs, what's not been expended by department uh, to see if that's reasonable. And there is the risk th with reserves like BAUs that taxpayers are paying more than they need to. Okay, City Council always struggled to, to get information on uh, when I was the mayor, there were councillors who would say, well, how many employees do we have? And we never had a report that actually came to city council that told us exactly how many employees there were by department. And uh, I, th I thought it was very difficult to get that. So you need to know how many full-time employees there are, how many part-time employees there are, how many seasonal employees there are, how many on contract. And I think that should be a public report. And it should go to council, and everybody should have that. So. Okay, uh, and so uh, the decision made to go to 0% tax increases was made in the fall of 2019 for 2020, and additional uh, reductions were, uh, were decided in the fall of 20 for 2020, for 2021 and 2022. Uh, the Finance Department recommended and Council approved uh, extended payment periods, uh, you know, t through that COVID period uh, to allow taxpayers to pay their taxes over a longer period of time to the end of September 30th. But uh, really the focus uh, not only was COVID, but also to minimize the tax creep that had been happening over time prior to 2018. So council tasked the city manager to identify what the impact of five and 10% budget reductions would have on the department basis. Uh, in the end, uh, some of those recommendations were taken into account and council directed that a 5% tax uh, staff reduction be implemented over two years. So some flexibility that would also take into account some natural attrition. And uh, so that was the direction in order to achieve the 0%. Uh, other municipalities and other cities also implemented zero tax increases over the same time period. So we weren't unique in Lethbridge. Uh, other cities, notably Red Deer, also implemented 5% tax reductions. And uh, those weren't applicable to police and fire, our protective services. So one of the things that helped me a lot was regular meetings with other mayors. There's a group called the Mid-Sized Mayors, 18 other municipalities similar to Lethbridge. I would learn a lot of things talking to them about their finances, and those were great meetings. And I'd find out what challenges do they face and how are those challenges being met and how are they similar to Lethbridge. A uh, challenge Lethbridge will have going forward is lowering the non-residential tax rate. So that's, that's how we uh, compare to other cities for uh, potential investors. So our non-residential tax rate is about 2.6, 2.7 times our residential tax pay rate. Other municipalities, the other 18 municipalities are lowering their non-residential tax rates. Most of them are below two. We probably should have a report, an independent report, showing what our non-residential tax rate is and what it is in other cities. That, that, that would show us, because I think in the end, we're going to have a problem attracting investors. And uh, so we need, we need to make sure that we lower that tax rate, but politically, almost impossible to do. Because if you lower the, the tax rate of the non-residential taxpayers at the expense of the residential taxpayers, politically, that's suicide. <laughs> like, residential taxpayers are not going to want to subsidize non-residential taxpayers. So. So, uh, I just uh, have a couple more slides here. I don't know if I can fit them in in the, okay. This, is there a fire alarm? <laughs> this, is, this basically shows the average uh, house price in the 18 municipalities plus uh, Calgary and Edmonton. And uh, so for assessment purposes, and uh, the green ones are lower than average, the orange ones are uh, about average, and the red ones are uh, higher than average. That's basically what the average price houses are. And here is where we sit in terms of residential taxes by city. So uh, I'll give you the link to this. 
but it's an independent uh, verification or of taxes and, and what you would pay in different municipalities for the same valued house. Okay, so Lethbridge is, I think, number 18. So. You don't have to be the highest, but that will be a challenge going forward if our taxes, uh, tax rates go up higher than other municipalities. And again, if our non-residential taxpayers aren't competitive with other municipalities, it's about our reputation as well. So how do, we, how, do we, how do we solve that issue going forward? And I think here, here's a link to uh, where I got that data from. And I guess uh, whether it's KPMG or whether it's uh, this link, we've got to use an external source to verify uh, the information that we're getting from the departments. Okay. So I think I've mentioned uh, there could be an impact on future economic development. And uh, one thing I'd say is, going forward, is regionalism a good thing for the city of Lethbridge? And uh, yes and no. Yes, if we can move forward. I think the airport was a great example of, of we needed to turn a, a regional asset into benefit the city, and Lethbridge was the only one that could invest in it. Uh, the other municipalities didn't have the funds to do it. Uh, but on the other hand, we don't want to be competing with our neighbors for investment in the future. If we want to solve, uh, in, if we want to increase our municipal tax base to the benefit of all taxpayers, new investments have to be happening in the city of Lethbridge, not in the, in the neighboring, in the surrounding communities. So encourage the city staff to be entrepreneurial thinkers. There's many examples of that. Uh, they've already done that already. There are staff who have innovative advice, ideas and have ad adapted those. And we need to have investment incentive programs, or we, d we actually had some, we have five new ones, uh, to encourage new investment in the city of Lethbridge. So use two, 2022 as the base year, because that's the end of the 000. zero, zero. Uh, implement the staff headcount report by department. Uh, BAU reports, I think focus on those and other. Uh, uh, reports uh, going forward where, you, where we basically have reserves, use the KPMG reports as a starting point and bring back, uh, bring back for forecast counts, uh, reports to council. I think uh, we benefited from forecasting from our financial service people and uh, I think that helped. So uh, municipal finances are, uh, are a balance. There's, uh, there's tax rates, there's service levels, there's reserves, and there's debt load. Uh, right now, the only debt load we have in terms of tax-supported debt is for the leisure center. I think previous councils before us were proud that they had no uh, tax-supported debt, but there's a, over $50 million uh, that, uh, that is in uh, tax-supported de debt over 20 years. So uh, I think that's basically covers most of the things I wanted to say today. I want to say thanks to uh, my council colleagues who served with me uh, on two terms. I want to say thanks to the city managers and to the professional staff in financial services who uh, do provide excellent reports. And uh, uh, with that, I'll say thank you and take your questions. Thank you. So as we are a not-for-profit organization, we rely on donations and memberships in order to continue. So you can purchase an annual SACPA membership at the, end of the, at the end of the session at the table in the back. We accept cash, check, debit, credit, you name it. We'll take it. So um, also, there's a suggestion box back there, so if you like to suggest future speakers, please do let us know. So uh, thank you to the LSCO who provided this room free of charge, and thank you for patronizing their lunch counter. We thank the University of Lethbridge for their ongoing support. We thank to Shaw TV and Bridge City TV for recording our sessions. You can also watch SACPA on Shaw Spotlight TV or SACPA.ca on YouTube. We also thank the uh, Lethbridge Herald for covering our talks and, and their support. So next week's speaker will be Shannon Phillips, the MLA for Lethbridge East, who will present a talk entitled Building Strong Communities and a Strong Economy for Alberta. 
then we ask those uh, who will be asking questions to line up along the wall here. And please state your name and your question briefly. Please, uh, no long preludes. If you prefer to write your question, you can uh, write your question and hand it over to me and I'll ask it on your behalf. Okay, so uh, if anybody has any questions, they can come along and... No questions for Cooley Chris? <laughs> well, I'll ask her for a question then as we wait. You know, you were comparing all these rates and then the tax, the cost of taxes based on the value of the house. But in Chestermere or in Calgary, the value of a house would be like, what, five times that in Lethbridge? Or whatever, it, well, heck of a lot more than we'd buy here in Lethbridge. So how can you compare that? How can you compare these tax rates when uh, the residential tax rate is based on the value of your home? And uh, if we've got a home here that's worth $300,000 and we're paying so much, and then someone has a half a million dollar house the same size in Chestermere. So I'm just wondering how that is, how, how can you compare those? It's, it's part of the apples and oranges argument. Uh, the, when you look at the different, uh, in the presentation I, I had listed all the municipalities, and including uh, places like Chestermere and uh, uh, others, uh, there are, I think, Canmore was also in there, similar. But also, uh, there's different levels of service. So it, it is very difficult to do direct comparisons. As I said, you try and, try and pick a municipality that's very similar to yours, right? So that's why, that's why I said pick, pick one that's like Red Deer, almost identical, other than, you know, similar in size, similar, you know, values. And when you look at the house price values, average house price value, uh, according to the study that I used, very similar house, house values. So uh, that would be uh, what I would suggest. You can't really compare to Chestermere. Uh, there, it's basically a residential community. It's a high-end residential community. Has very little non-residential tax base, because I think it's, uh, cities like Lethbridge and Red Deer that are regional centers also need to have a vibrant uh, non-residential tax base as well as uh, uh, a residential tax base. So you try and pick those communities that are similar to yours for the better comparisons. But on a list, that gives you an indicator where, where you are. And in terms of your decisions going forward, uh, how does that impact? You know, uh, you have to be where you are to understand what the impact of your current decisions might be. Yeah. We'll just stand there and yeah. Bev Mintel-Atherstone, thank you very much, Chris. It's good to get a, a, shall we say, an unbiased view of what's happening with the finances from someone who's been there. Um, I have two questions for you. The first one relates to taxation of houses worth different values. So when we pay our income tax, it's based on our, our income and we have different levels depending on how much we pay. So the, more, the richer we are, the more we pay. It's a higher percentage. What would keep the city from doing the same thing so that people are not taxed out of their homes, so that people, let's say, with homes that are worth valued around 250000 would have a lower rate. And then when you get up to, say, 400000 a slightly higher rate, then when you get up to $800,000 value of your home, higher and over a million, even higher. That's the first question. The second question is, um, when, when we moved here over 40 years ago, the city had a utility in the river bottom, and I think you have a utility now. So um, what options does the city have for making money outside of collecting taxes from the taxpayers? Thank you. Okay, graduated tax rates based on the value of your home. Uh, I think the one thing that could preclude that is uh, the Municipal Government Act. If, if you wanted to, uh, the Municipal Government, Government Act prescribes a way of, uh, of taxing. So it is based on, on the, the uh, fair market value of your home. So there's a defini definition in there. Um, I think one thing that would, would probably happen is you would, if you tried to tax on a graduated rate, I, 
I don't think it, municipalities would really think that's a good thing in the end. You want to have a mix of taxpayers. Um, you might find people building uh, high cost houses, and I think you already do to some extent, just outside the city limits. And you see residential areas of higher, uh, higher cost homes, maybe in the county of Lethbridge. And if you're wealthier, people tended to build their homes out there. Uh, I think that could have a uh, negative impact on the city as a whole in the long run. You want to have a balance and you want to have a healthy mix of, uh, of higher priced and lower priced homes So it, within your tax base. And you don't want to distort natural decision making as much as possible. Now the second w question you had was, uh, Rima? Utilities. Yeah, the city does have revenue streams from w water and wastewater and also from electricity. Um, so, and there, there, there are dollars that, they're, they're smaller revenues coming in, but they also help uh, alleviate. Uh, the, those, those are, uh, they're significant, but I, uh, I think going into the business of generating electricity, there's some interesting, I think you had a presentation last week uh, on some, that's, there's some potential for things like that. Um, it'll take some innovating th innovative thinking to uh, see whether we can take advantage of maybe some city spaces that could potentially generate, but I'd leave that question more to the engineers. I think there has to be a business opportunity. Yeah. Thanks, Ken Sears. Hi, Chris. Good to see you again. Um, what I heard you saying is there's less money coming in from the provincial and the federal levels of government. And on the other hand, you have faced, the cities are facing pressure from the rural municipalities around them where it seems to me that there is a race to the bottom as far as taxes are non-residential. They will do cut taxes like crazy in order to attract larger businesses into that community. Um, at what point does that race become self-defeating for a municipality to, to start to play that game? Yeah. Okay, okay just some clarifications. I, I think the federal government grants actually have gone up significantly and they actually helped a lot through uh, COVID, uh, uh, basically money w was given to provinces for distribution and we, been, we applied for projects and, and funding from that. Uh, provincially, we are getting squeezed. Now that we have a $12 billion surplus projected, uh, could some of those decisions be reversed? And uh, what would be the holdup for restoring some surety on uh, MSI funding, saying MSI is going to continue, uh, that municipal sustainability capital funding from the province so uh, with that, uh, in terms of uh, communities competing, that's always going to be the case. Um, I think it's more so in the U.S. I talked to Mr. Irving. Mr. Irving invested over $430 million in the potato processing plant here. One of the things he said to me, he said, hey, you know, down in Macon, Georgia, we built a pulp and paper plant, $500 million U.S., and we got lots of incentives and concessions from the municipality, the, uh, the state, and from the U.S. federal government. And uh, we decided to go ahead and build a second one, a second $500 million U.S. pulp and paper plant in Macon, Georgia. So they got two of them. He said, can you do something similar for us? Well, the provincial government had brought out Bill 7, and basically allowing municipalities to provide concessions uh, tax concessions to, uh, as incentives to industries. But there's no way we could afford to provide what Mr. Irving was expecting to receive based on his experience in Macon, Georgia, for sure. Then you have the existing tax base. Uh, employers who've been here for 20, 30 years, uh, uh, even longer. So if you, if you provide a special tax incentive uh, uh, on a long-term basis to a new investor. What about the guys who've been here employing people for many years? So uh, there's, a, there's a, certainly a, a judgment uh, to be made. Uh, you, we do have incentives. Uh, there was a nice suite of about five incentives that was developed by uh, uh, 
some, some of our staff at the city. And uh, certainly uh, some of the benefits of the 608 building uh, took advantage of, uh, basically they have a lower tax rate for the first five years because they're reinvesting and redeveloping a building here, in an older building here in the city. Uh, so those types of uh, incentives are good incentives and uh, eventually they, they return to the same rate of tax as everybody else. But it's, a, it's an incentive to uh, revive idolize the city. So some of them make sense, but you do have to be careful. It's a slippery slope if you, uh, if you begin rewarding new investors and not those who've always been here and those who might expand. Yeah. Hello, Chris. Uh, thanks very much for coming in from uh, the beautiful Castle Valley. It's a hard place to leave this time of the year, I'm sure. Uh, my question relates to, uh, Knut Peterson is my name, by the way. <laughs> uh, it relates to the homeless situation, the problems we have mainly downtown. In Lethbridge these days, it's not something that happened overnight. Mm -hmm. Can you give us a little bit of historical view on that, and if you have any any solutions, you would be a millionaire, right? If you, if you aren't already. Yeah. Can you give us a little bit of a, of a, your take on the situation in Lethbridge right now? Well, I'm not a millionaire, <laughs> Knut. Well, one of the things that shocked me when I first became the mayor is I gave up a full-time job in the private sector where I had a pension plan, I had uh, profit sharing, I had, uh, and I got to the city of Lethbridge, I said, where's the pension plan? There is no pension plan. Well, <laughs> I spent 25% of my salary every year for the last eight years putting it in my RSPs, so <laughs> I'm not a millionaire. But anyways, um, in, in terms of the, the uh, homelessness situation, I think, what I find is that we struggle to deal with homelessness and we struggle to deal with drug addiction in the city. And what was most frustrating to me was any programs only went to Calgary and Edmonton. There would be things like transportation subsidy programs only to go to Calgary and Edmonton. Uh, they could subsidize people using the transit system. We didn't get those. We didn't, they, there were, uh, I, I guess homelessness, we, it's a little bit more our own fault. In those cities, they have uh, community organizations funded with business and um, from, the, from the community to come up with possible solutions for homelessness and uh, they have projects that they built that came out of these committees. I don't think we've got to the point where our committees will recommend a homelessness solution and actually implement it. We're still in the stage where the committee can go only so far when the plans become public, there's a negative reaction and we struggle to go forward. So uh, that, that's a challenge. There's been an interesting development in Ontario this week with homelessness and I think it's a heads up to City Council. On uh, Monday there was a court ruling in the city of Waterloo basically uh, saying that the city couldn't remove uh, tent cities anymore because the homeless, the, the, ho the number of homeless people exceeds the spaces to accommodate them. And if that's an Ontario ruling, not applicable in BC, but if that, if, if uh, for example, the challenges we've had with tent cities, pop-up spent, if somebody challenged that in court and we had a similar ruling in Alberta, uh, that would be problematic for the city of Lethbridge. But one of, the, one of the issues is that we just have not ever had the support on those two issues from the provincial government that we actually need. So cities like Lethbridge and Red Deer and others have exactly the same problems that Calgary and, and Edmonton have, but we do not get the same levels of support in terms of solutions. I think there was, um, provincial government announced funding yesterday to address uh, crime in the city of, uh, in downtown Edmonton. Well, where's, where's the funding for the city of Lethbridge? You know, we have crime in downtown as well. People are very concerned about that. So why, do, why, does, why, is, why are cities like Lethbridge always left off that funding? Uh, Trevor Page. Yep. 
With climate change already on us, and agriculture being so important to southern Alberta and Lethbridge, to what extent does City Council collaborate with the county? Or is that done by economic development Lethbridge? I mean, you want to attract new investors. Agriculture is our base. What are we doing about that? Yeah. So we do, we do have lots of agricultural processors in the city of Lethbridge because we have the infrastructure to support them. And one of the expenses that goes into that is maintaining the infrastructure in the industri industrial park. So um, Cavendish, I think, was a, a great example. There are great benefits in the county. Uh, as we expand the, uh, the number of acres that are growing uh, potatoes throughout southern Alberta to, supply, to support uh, uh, potato processing plants, of course, uh, we have, we have the infrastructure to maintain them in the city um, and can ensure that the uh, the waste from those uh, potato processing plants and other you know we've got Canberra Foods we've got the distillery um, many other uh, we've got vegetable processing plants uh, you need to be able to manage the waste that comes out of that, those plants as well as supply the water and all the resources to make those plants successful. That's a challenge for, for uh, a rural uh, county. We can, we can host the plants. Uh, a, lo a lot of the agricultural development and the supports can happen. Uh, you know, so irrigation, uh, provincially uh, funded, has really helped agricultural development in, in southwest Alberta. And I think uh, Lethbridge has benefited from uh, uh, being able to process agricultural products. So working, working together is really important. Protecting the quality of the river water is going to be really important as well. So uh, we've heard some concerns about selenium uh, from coal mining operations. Uh, if that gets into the Old Man River, how does that impact the crops that are grown and the, uh, and the products that are processed in the city of Lethbridge? So we can all work together on challenges that we see going forward. <laughs> Ian Hurdle, uh, Chris, I should thank you for uh, doing mayor twice because not too many of us want to stand up and do that job. <laughs> um, also, I should uh, in, uh, welcome you to my neighborhood that you moved. You're about four kilometers away from me, so I should say hello sometime. I have two questions. Uh, one is a little more serious. We used to have letters to the editor by Mr. Babick and then by his son. And uh, they were really quite clear on their figures, but as an outsider, uh, can you comment on them? The second question is, uh, uh, you went from a distillery job, what are you doing now? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay, thank you. Probably Dr. Hurdle, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I think, um, so I think, uh, last question first, uh, I'm retired now, which is great, and uh, I, I enjoyed working at the distillery for so many years, and uh, that, that it was a very hands-on experience. I uh, couldn't think of a better place to work in the city of Lethbridge. And then, uh, after over 30 years, Coming to be the, become the mayor of Lethbridge uh, was a refreshing change for me, it was like a mental health break, and it was doing something completely different, and uh, that was a lot of fun. And I think I was the first person elected mayor that hadn't previously served on city council. So my, my perspective was quite fresh uh, from those who had served previous terms. And, uh, and I kind of questioned things probably a little more than some people would at the, at the beginning to try and understand, and I got a, a lot of great support. Um, now your first question, I'm retired now, I forgot it, it was three minutes ago when you asked that question. <laughs> the editorials. Okay, okay, the editorials, and, and there are some local experts, and uh, they, you know, they do their best. I think um, Mr. Ken Eichel is another one who uh, uh, does a lot of research and prepares and asks some very good questions as well. Um, when I was mayor, I would get some questions from Blake and his brother, and I, I would do my best to answer them. You know, I tried to answer them respectfully, and, uh, and they would question things, and uh, rightfully so. I think the reports that are referred to, the, uh, the unaudited reports and the uh, financial summary that the city does, the consulting process the city does, they ask for your input ahead of time into the budget, but I think we're very good for the community uh, 
you know, these reports are presented to city council. If they were put out into the public and you actually allowed the public to come and ask questions about what's in the contents of these reports, I think that would be really informative and helpful. I think it would help uh, community understanding of city finances. So I don't, I, I think that the people in the financial department of the city of Lethbridge, uh, they are professionals and uh, they've done a great job and I think it would be really helpful and great for transparency if uh, they and council could answer the questions that are in the audit, in on a, unaudited report that'll come out, the next one will come out probably before the end of March for the 2020, 2022 year. So you look at all the expenses and w look at the discrepancies and the explanations, there's a lot of really good information in that report and a lot of good information in the annual financial summary as well. But people should, they shouldn't just be done and presented to council with a few questions and those reports need to be used more by the public to ask good questions like the Babkeys did and, and Mr. Eichel us. Chris, the moderator, let me have one more question. Um, looking in the uh, rearview mirror, uh, do you have any regrets <laughs> being mayor? <laughs> I, I have no regrets and I actually think some people had a tougher job than I had and uh, I felt bad for my executive assistant. Uh, she, was, she, was, she was between me and the public a lot of the time and uh, she, she, did, she did a fantastic job and uh, I think the police chief has a tough job and uh, you know the, the basically the public perspective of, of the police has taken a bit of a beating over the last few years. There's been a number of high profile issues that you know some of them went nationwide. And uh, uh, I think uh, managing those uh, has been stressful uh, for the police chiefs and, uh, and acting chiefs along the way. Uh, there were some days I would have a bad day and I'd say, thank goodness, I'm not the police chief. You know, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> it's, it's the, the idea is that principle that you might think you're having a tough day, but there's always somebody having a tougher day. So, uh, I, and I, you know, I, I, loved, uh, I loved the community service piece. I, uh, things went really well uh, for quite a long time. And uh, I think in two, 2018, 2019 was the first year where there were more than a billion dollars of new construction happening in the city of Lethbridge at the same time. And uh, so the, uh, the new science facility at the university, the Cavendish plant, the leisure center, uh, and a host of other uh, expansions, it was, it was really cool to be the mayor and go to a series of openings uh, of fantastic things, you know, and I didn't do that by myself. People made those things happen. You know, uh, kudos to, uh, to those who came up the plans and we were just happy to, to be there and, uh, and approve some fundings and get matching grants and those types of things. That, uh, great that the airport, it's been redeveloped. Fantastic to have a downtown bus terminal. Uh, uh, I hosted the, the mayors and Reeves and uh, the, the 18 mayors, mid-sized city mayors in 2019. And we did a tour of, this, of the city and showed them all the new stuff. They were amazed at all the stuff we had in Lethbridge. And uh, so uh, I think uh, there was, a, there was there were, I had no regrets, but now I'm glad I didn't run for another four years. <laughs> I, I feel like the Prime Minister of New Zealand. Thank goodness I'm out. <laughs> and uh, and, and uh, I, I love being retired. It's, uh, when you're in the spotlight every day uh, or almost every day for eight years and there's some really tough questions to answer about things that aren't you know, going well and uh, it's nice to, to step away from all of that and just enjoy retirement, see my family travel, <laughs> get out in the fresh air. <laughs> yeah. Hi, my name is Patricia Buswell. I don't know if I misunderstood you in the middle, but you, you seem to say that the City Council had asked on many occasions to have from the administration the number of employees. How can a city of Lethbridge, which is really a giant business, possibly run without knowing what their payroll is? Okay. 
I'm, I'm sure they do know the payroll, and I'm sure they did know the number of employees. It just, was, was, uh, it just wasn't reported to council, and councillors would ask, well, how many employees do we have? How, you know, do we, do we have employee creep? And we couldn't quite get that answer. So uh, I'd, I'd say one of, as I said, one of my learnings would be annually include a, um, and a report that includes the number of employees as well as the uh, the payroll dollars. I think that would that would just provide greater greater transparency, and uh, would have, would avoid that kind of frustration. And yeah, thank you, Chris. Uh, before we can see, uh, finish up, we do have a take home message, something to wrap it all up. Yep. <laughs> I was impressed with the work and the, and the information that was provided to council overall. I really would encourage people to take, uh, who are interested in, in taxes, uh, you can get angry every once in a while when the tax rates go up, but uh, if you actually inform yourself, and I found the reports were very readable. And uh, so read the unaudited report, become informed uh, about different aspects of taxation, uh, see if there can be more public consultation on, on the information once it's presented, and not, not just presented at council. And I think we do need to have independent verification of what's presented to council. So uh, what, are the, what are the, what external sources, I don't know if we can afford to do KPMG on a regular basis, but go back to that as a reference and say, okay, uh, here's how we compare to other uh, municipalities for this department or that department. And uh, the information I showed on comparative tax rates between cities, uh, I think that is important going forward. How are we, are we improving? Are we, are we getting worse? What is, uh, what's our ability to attract new investment as well? What are our non-residential tax rates versus other municipalities in Alberta? So uh, that's, that would be uh, a few of the things that I recommend going forward. Well, thank you very much, Chris. Let's give him another hand. Thank you. And we hope to see you all uh, next week when Shannon Phillips will be our speaker. Thank you.